All right. So uh, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for coming on. Uh, your book was really, really interesting. It's interesting to see how much current life is shaped by what happened and how much opium has shaped our life and our present life. Uh, and it's it's crazy that it's not really taught in schools as much. I don't know about India, but is the history of the opium trade taught in schools in India? Not at all. Like it's... Uh... Maybe it is, you know, a paragraph here, a paragraph there, but it isn't uh, an important part of the his of our history at all. Like, wow. So before we, we start, you know, talking about the British and the opium trade, before colonialism and before the British came to ruling India, what was the role of opium during that time in India? And, and you know, was it being used by the people or, or was it being only used by the kings and the queens at the time before the British took over? Okay, so the, like, opium has this sort of, like, long, like, prehistory before it becomes uh, uh, this kind of central commodity that makes people rich and gets, pe get, gets people addicted and things like that. So if you, if you go back, if you go back in time, you know, the Greeks are using opium, uh, like, uh, to the, the, descent, the ancestors of, of the Turkish people uh, Arabs, Indians, they're all, they're all kind of using opium in, um, in the kind of home remedy sense, right? It's, it's a, it's a, it's a herb that you can, uh, that is growing kind of around you. You can harvest it, you can use it. And you're usually using it either in, as medicine, as some form of like pain relief, or you're using it as in some kind of like ritual sense, like, you know, you're kind of using it in some sort of like religious context or something like that. But like before the 16th century, before, you know, Europeans come to, uh, you know, India and start engaging in this trade, it's, it's something that either like the common people are using, you know, like with their aches and pains or to some extent, like, uh, like you said, like kings and queens, we have this kind of like Mughal uh, relationship with opium where, uh, you know, these Mughal emperors are, like they're kings of the world, right? They right. they they don't they don't need anything. They don't want anything. They just kind of spend their lives in in luxury and indulgence to some extent. I mean, they have problems, but but um, like Jahangir is like said to be like you know someone who like really enjoyed drinking. He really enjoyed opium as a kind of recreational drug. Like he was just you know, and the the idea is Shah Jahan, uh, his son, was supposed to be. A, a teetotaler and like a big disappointment to his father like Jahangir complains that you know Shah Jahan is like 23 and he's like this kid doesn't he doesn't drink like he doesn't That's do funny. anything <laughs> like there's a there's a there's a there's almost that kind of disappointment and but you know Shah Jahan eventually does we know that at 24 like he starts. so this is a very like it's either like an indulgence or like it's a medicine it has these like various uh modes but yeah it's not it's not a commodity. It's not a trade good till the British arrive, or rather till the Dutch start. But yeah. And then when when the British, or I guess when the Europeans arrive, all right, do they initially see opium as a product, or does that come after? So, I think uh, it's hard to tell which started first. But the British were using opium in Britain. Like it's it's again like there is this kind of long history of like medicine uh, in Europe as well, right? Where opium is considered a part of it again. People are taking it there. So like I think the first the first kind of trade with India regarding opium is the British importing it for use in Britain. Uh, and the Portuguese start trading it with China a little bit. The Dutch are the first to really go, hey, this uh, this 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 could be something that the, the trade could be huge. This could make us rich. The Dutch, Dutch East India Company is the is the beginning of a opium as like a, a central trade good that will, and mostly they're taking it to Southeast Asia, they're taking it to China, they're taking it to places like that. They're not taking it back to Europe. Like that's, so they're trading, they're taking opium from India and they're trading it with Southeast Asia in exchange for like spices and they're taking those spices back to, back to Europe. And, you know, obviously the spices are like, like the thing about spices is that they're like a really small quantity fetches you a huge price. Mm -hmm. So like a shipload of spices is is buying you a castle back home. Like it's like it is like it's it's a huge huge thing. So uh, so there is this whole thing about how the opium how the opium trade starts as as a way for 
uh, Europeans to get what they really want. Like, you know, it's just an intermediary product uh, that they're trading. And for the British, what they really want is tea, right? Yeah, tea plays a really big role in the opium trade uh, we're going to see later on. So I guess tea is the first character of the story, the initial character. Yeah. So how yeah. does what's what's the story uh, behind tea and how does tea connect with opium? So the, the important thing to know about tea is that at a certain point in history, all tea it comes from China. There is, right. there is no tea that exists outside uh, the Chinese kind of empire uh, or, you know, um, and from China, it makes its way uh, through trade across the world. So there's this really fun fact about tea that uh, like in almost all languages in the world, the word for tea either starts with the ter sound or the cher sound, you know, as in uh, cher for chai. And uh, the idea is that if the thing that decides whether your language uh, has a ter sound or a cher sound for tea is whether it came from the east coast or or, or uh, the western part of China, you know. Cool. <laughs> so that is uh, that's that's the that's it's, it's just really fascinating. You can trace you can you can figure out how tea got to a certain place based on the sound of the word for it. Um, and the idea is that once tea comes to Europe, it becomes something something new, something interesting that primarily the aristocracy are excited by, um, it, you know, the European like, you know, princes and princesses are like, uh, are like drinking it. And then from there, it kind of makes its way to, to Britain. Um, so there's this interesting detail where like uh, Bombay was current, was, was initially uh, owned or controlled or claimed by the Portuguese. Right. And when a Portuguese princess marries uh, the, a British prince, like Bombay gets traded as like a as like a wedding gift, yes. and uh, it's that princess uh, who kind of uh, who's who's credited with popularizing tea in Britain because she drinks it in Portugal. Now she goes to Britain and she's kind of like a strange like uh, like outsider there. You know, she has this different culture, and now she's what is she drinking? You know, she's drinking tea. This sounds interesting, and it becomes <laughs> it becomes something kind of you know cool there and. It trickles down from the aristocracy slowly to, to Britain and uh, to the common people. And when it reaches the common people, by that stage, it becomes like an obsession. Tea is something new. It's something It's something that, first of all, has this small like dose of caffeine, right? It's like yeah. energizing. Yeah. And, like, it, 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 and it becomes an obsession. The idea is that at some point, Britain is importing so much tea and consuming so much tea that it's, that it's 10% of their entire state revenue right so they, they're like the country's economy is basically you know being being carried by this one product called tea because it's just drinking so much of it and it's all coming from china and the idea is that they're spending so much money importing it from china that they're literally running out of physical silver like their coins as china wants silver in exchange for tea and britain is sending so much silver out that they're like their physical reserves of it, they don't have any more, you know? And they're like, what will we do? <laughs> like, what will we do if we run out of silver? And, you know, because we need more tea. Uh, and um, so they're looking for goods that China will, will take instead of silver. They're like, right. hey, we, we manufacture things. That's what, that's what uh, they pride themselves on. They're like, oh, you know, we're, uh, we're making clockwork. We're making, uh, like, we've just, you know, got this steam engine, like, and things like that. They're, they're, and, and cloth, like, you know, they have this whole weaving industry there. And they're like, you know, they try to convince China to, to take these goods in exchange for tea. And China basically isn't interested because, because the Chinese, like, emperor is like, like, whatever Britain has to offer, he's already got it. And he's got more of it than, nice. like, he's just not impressed. <laughs> and, and finally, that's where opium comes in because, um, like, the British Empire, the British like government, the British, uh, the East India Company, uh, more specifically, they realize that there is this market for opium there. That even though it's technically banned in China, it's like you know, in 1729, the emperor like bans opium uh, because he thinks it's becoming a problem already. Like before the trade is really kicked off, like you know, he's already like this is. This 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 doesn't do any good for for my uh, my empire or whatever. So 
so the, but the British realize there's a demand for it and uh, they start they start growing it in India and exporting it to China uh, and wouldn't, they use the cup yeah sorry. sorry wouldn't wouldn't selling it to if the if opium was banned in China wouldn't selling opium to China start like a, it would be very undiplomatic and, and could tarnish relationship aren't they worried about that they, they would so they have this kind of uh, they have this kind of very thin disguise okay so they say that uh, the British government officially does not do anything uh, they, they officially grow it in India and then they auction it out to whoever in Calcutta wants to buy it and uh, you know so it's private traders uh, private ship owners, uh, private merchants who like stand up in this auction and they buy it and they, you know, I'm doing scare, scare quotes here, they like smuggle it into China. Oh. And, you know, what, what this means is, is nothing like, you know, the British know what's happening and, you know, the Chinese emperor probably knows it's happening, but he can't do anything about it. But these private traders take it from Calcutta, they go to, they go to Canton and they, uh, they trade it with Chinese merchants there. And, you know, that's the thing. Chinese Ch- Chinese merchants in China are like it's illegal, but it's fine. This this thing sells here, and they are like even if the emperor says it's illegal, we're going to do it because this makes us rich. So it's not something like where where there is like China is one is one like monolith and has an opinion. No, no, no. Like they're, they're like Chinese people. They're like a diverse body, and they and they and they're also like. They also want to make money, right? The British right. merchants, the Chinese right. merchants, they're like two sides of a coin. So the Chinese really want to limit what kind of goods come in and out of the country. So they really control the ports uh, that Europeans have access to. Uh, and they control within the ports which merchants Europeans can trade with. So there's this thing called the Hong. So to, to get a trading license, to become a part of the Hong, like you have to, uh, you have to buy a license from uh, from the government and these licenses are super expensive like in the sense that not not officially but you have to pay a bribe to like to okay. get a license I see. and the bribes are like enormous uh, uh, and this is and this is just generally a part of chinese bureau- bureaucracy at the time where it's like extremely corrupt but so was every bureaucracy yeah. in the world um, so these 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 hong merchants they have, they've paid this bribe and it's a huge amount of money and they need to make it back so it's almost like, as far as they're concerned, we have to sell opium. That's the only way that, you know, we'll make this huge, you know, investment, uh, we'll recoup it. So that's kind of how, like, even though it's illegal, like opium is still getting into China. Why Why do they need opium from the, the British or in this case, India? Isn't there opium being grown in China? So the idea is that I think opium, like m- there might be attempts to grow it in China early, but initially it's just like uh, it's it's good and it's cheap and it's it's as much as you want is coming in right like that's the idea and the British are like willing to exchange it for tea so like I do, like so there isn't I think a great pressure to uh, to grow it yet. Okay, yeah. there's a you mentioned that the market is in Calcutta. Is there a reason yeah. why it's Calcutta and not uh, anywhere else? It's in Calcutta because. Um, because the British control it, right? Like that's that's Bengal that's, is, is is Britain's first like entry uh, into into India, right? Post Battle of Plassey, they they have this land, and it's the first place where the East India Company are are governors, right? They're 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 legally the the rulers of of this uh, giant piece of of Bengal, and so they have this ability to kind of incentivize slash coerce. Uh, farmers to grow opium uh, because they they want they want to collect opium as taxes and things like that. So they like they they get uh, thousands of Bengali farmers to switch from whatever they were growing before to growing opium, and uh, and then they can then auction that off in Calcutta and then take that. Right. So I mean, I'm familiar with uh, tea farms and tea estates in India and how yeah. tough and difficult and rough that is for the farmers that that grow it what is life like for an opium farmer and now that you just mentioned that like they force farmers to grow opium how does that affect farmers now does that uh does that make them more money or does that make them i guess uh less money and and rough and do they do they yeah and my i'll ask the next question after go ahead (laughs) (laughs) yeah no that's a really that's a really good question and uh like 
some some part of it involves understanding what farmer's life was like before that right so i you know i think the general consensus is that the the life for a farmer before the british is 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 still tough uh, but you know i think the thing that the british do is that they create this culture of indebtedness right like they make you uh, like borrow money so that you can like buy the seeds to uh, you know to plant your crops and then because of that you need to then repay that loan and it, you never earn enough in to to ever yeah. repay that loan because then you have to borrow again for the next year or whatever so there's the cycle of indebtedness that they kind of institute and that's their big way of of forcing people to grow opium right they're like you like you know we'll sell you the seeds whatever you owe us now you have to do this that kind of thing and and i think the 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 quality of life of farmers does like seriously go down post this i mean specifically also because opium is an addictive drug right like you have to um you can eat like it. some food yeah yeah you can you can so yeah it is a question of like how does it affect how you how you get your food and things like that you have to like grow food also like separately all of that but also like there's this thing about like you have to harvest the opium and for that that's a that's a physically strenuous thing right like you take a knife and you kind of cut the bud at the base so that the sap oozes out and it's like it's an intensive thing and there's this idea that um many farmers get unknowingly addicted to the opium that they grow because they're kind of licking the knife the blade as they cut wow. the sap and they're getting you know so it's a sort of like uh like i don't i don't think it ever becomes like a major uh, like pandemic problem yeah yeah i don't think yeah i think that's the right word i don't think it ever reaches that level in india in bengal like it does in china but the, there is like it is to whatever level it is it, it is a problem yeah okay wow this is class and gender and caste play into the opium farming i mean it 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 definitely does i mean the thing about the way farming works is that usually the land is owned by uh, a zamindar right like a, a landlord like a landowner they're usually upper caste uh, or you know elite in some uh, capacity or, yeah yeah and um and the farmers themselves most probably uh, uh a backward caste of some category because they are they are like tenants right they are farming the land and then paying a portion of that to their zamindar as as rent and then the zamindar collects that and pays it to the uh, to the british right like that's the that's the chain of of uh, of, of taxation and yeah so there is there is 100% like a class despite like the zamindars are like oh we have to switch to opium okay this is not ideal but we're fine with it like it doesn't affect them at all like their like the revenues are potentially even getting better um but for farmers yeah this is like you know their lives are significantly getting worse and there is there is definitely like class and caste like happening here yeah wow well, and gender of course because like i mean like the like usually i think like farming is like like gender segregated there are certain kinds of the certain roles that are done by men certain roles done by women but uh, but but yeah like i'm like you know i i don't know much more than that specifically yeah. okay so now we're at a part where uh, opium is kicking off the, there's an industry in india now you have farmers and everything going on and the british are are making money and uh they're getting opium being sold to china i i'm assuming that now you can have like other farmers in other places in india growing opium and going straight to china and cutting out the middleman <laughs> yeah 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 that is like yeah it is still like you know uh in some sense like an open market so yeah what 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 interesting that happens is as the as we get to the 19th century right like as we get to 18 uh, 1801 1802 that that kind of time which is the focus of my book like the 19th century is more or less what my book focuses on because that's the uh like like the first half of that is the peak of the opium trade so what happens is calcutta has this monopoly uh, till a certain point and then they start hearing they start hearing rumors that opium chests like chests of opium these wooden chests full of opium are coming to china 
but they're not the ones selling it. And they're like, it's 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 from India, clearly. Like you know, it it looks like it. Uh, you know, the ships are from India, but like it, we're not the we're not. It's not from it's not from our ports. It's not from our auctions. Where is it coming from? And they realize that on the west coast of India, uh, around Bombay, around Maharashtra, uh, places like that, uh, there is like a competing uh, a competing industry of like opium production is happening. Wow. So. These are Indian Indian states. These are like uh, you know princely states. Like uh, they're part of this Maratha Confederacy at this point. The British have not like conquered them yet, and they are they realize that there is this you know market for opium. So farmers are growing it. Like uh, Indian uh, zamindars, landlords, they're like they're uh, packaging it. They're uh, hard, you know putting it in in chests and they are selling it to usually usually European traders, but also Indian ones, uh, at, you know, uh, and then they are like financing it themselves. So there's this kind of homegrown uh, capitalism happening. There's this whole homegrown like trade route, uh, you know, like every part of it, like there are hundreds of people involved, thousands, and it's quite complex and sophisticated because there are multiple ports. And once the British find out, they try to, they try to stop it. They try to um, stomp it down. And they start by like trying to close off the ports, right? They go like, okay, you can't take it out of Bombay, which they control. And so, uh, you know, these Indian like merchants will find another port and they'll try to close that down by like, if it's an Indian port, they'll go to the, the prince that controls it and they'll try to sign an agreement to kind of lock that port down as well. And these Indian merchants that they call like smugglers or whatever, like the, these guys would just keep finding different ways. They might go to the Portuguese who operate out of Goa, uh, and places like that, they might go to, uh, at some point, the British, like, they spent 10, 20 years trying to, trying to get these, like, Indian states to, to stop growing it, and they can't get them to stop growing it, to stop, like, exporting it, and, like, it doesn't work, and it's, like, fruitless, and it takes ages, because you just, like, they just don't have that level of control, right? It's right. not, like, they don't have, they don't have the army that can just be there in every, you know every city or whatever it is such a small operation actually and so like these like these merchants will go all the way to karachi like they will like they you know like it's like wherever for, whichever port, yeah they figure it out so eventually the british realize that like they can't do anything about this whole like western coast producing opium so they they decide that if you can't beat them join them that kind of thing and they say listen uh export it from bombay like just pay this small uh, sort of like customs, like this small like tax, and you can just export from Bombay legally. And the idea is that this tax is cheaper than the cost of transporting it or smuggling it to like these other places, right? Like, so then, you know, like once the British do this, once the British kind of legalize uh, this opium trade out of Bombay, like that's the, that's the real like starting point for Bombay as a city. You know, it wow. takes off from there because like all this trade comes into Bombay and with this trade comes money and with this money comes like investment into the city and all of that stuff. Yeah. So in Bombay, who makes the, who makes the most money from the opium business? <laughs> so, I mean, the, the, the British make some money, but it, the interesting thing is that it's all these like Indian merchants really, right? Like they, like they're, like they get into their wealth, they find their wealth here. And there's this whole class of Indian merchants that emerge. At the forefront of that are, are the Parsis. The Parsis are as a community, like have like a large number of them are into trade, specifically the opium trade. And they they monopolize it to some extent in the beginning. And they they become um they become ex exceedingly wealthy. They become kind of like the merchant class of Bombay. There are others, of course. It's just the Parsi that some in some sense dominated. And that's kind of how I, like, I discovered this and became interested in this, uh, in this whole like story is because like as a journalist I was just kind of like writing about this one particular Parsi trader called Jamsad G, GG Boy, who basically um, becomes all basically becomes the wealthiest man in India. Like it, these things are like hard to like know for sure, but he definitely becomes one of the wealthiest men in India. And, you know, he, he retires at 40 because he becomes like, he's just so wealthy. Like he decides like at some point that he wants to, he, he doesn't need to make money anymore. He wants to focus on his legacy 
and he spends all his time doing charity and philanthropy because he wants to like essentially become a baronet like he wants like the british to recognize him and give him this this title right these 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 uh, official honors uh, you know right. and these come okay. from the queen right like so it, he's like i am an indian like i want like i feel like i have reached a certain level of like wealth and nobility and class that i i want the british to recognize it and i want it to be something that can get passed down to my to my children right so he doesn't want it to just be like like he becomes uh, he becomes a knight i think early on and he's like this is not enough like i want to become a baronet because i want my son to be a baronet and so on and so on so what happens to him in the end he becomes a baronet or he yeah he becomes the he becomes the first non british person to ever become a baronet like it's this this passing guy from bombay because of the opium trade and and it's that's not it's not a coincidence right because the opium trade is something that the british are profiting from he he's like essential to their to their continued success right they respect him they go like this this is a this is the kind of indian you know that uh, <sighs> that that we can honor right like he's one of the good ones <laughs> yeah 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 i see what you mean yeah yeah, wow. yeah. Uh, so now Bombay is is booming, and uh, not just from the opium, but also from cotton too. I think. Yeah. And yeah. Um, okay, so now China. Well, before we get started with China, what is China like as a society? I mean, are they really, really that strong and that powerful that they can control who comes in, who comes out? Because right now India is being taken over, but China seems fine. So is China? Is it? Uh, is it? You know strong and and there's you know i guess smarter than the british at this point or are they just very uh insecure and defensive and just don't want anybody coming in because they saw the british coming into india i mean that's a, that's a that's a hard question to answer because like you think about like the mughal empire right the mughal empire was was a strong empire at one point and then somehow like for for really complicated reasons including like like the economy and just generally like you know like political like strength like the british are able to kind of conquer them completely right same with china china at some point is a very strong empire has this great bureaucracy that basically controls the whole country and uh, administers it extremely well but you know for for various complicated reasons that i am not an expert in by any means like there is a decline in the level of control that the emperor can exert you know this bureaucracy just becomes uh becomes ineffective in in giving common chinese people like like any kind of quality of life right like um and once that happens like once once the state becomes like ineffective in providing for you like you find ways to survive outside the state right like you're right. doing your right? and this is where you know this whole like corruption and smuggling and all this stuff like happens because like who cares about the state at this point like they don't do anything for me like that's the kind of uh, that's the that's the feeling i get uh and um so yeah at, at that point like the chinese emperor is like like these are and these are multiple emperors that we're talking about over the course of these 30 50 years that you know we're kind of like discussing which is like the early 19th century and like you know they're fighting wars on all sides like you know they're fighting rebellions because uh yeah because you know if your political control weakens someone's like i can govern this uh, right. this place better and that and some of these are popular rebellions and some of these are like warlords and things like that but but yeah i think um at, you know at, as we get to the mid 19th century like 1850 and things like that like um there is uh uh no no sorry much much earlier than that before the first opium war which is like 1842 like there is this uh like the chinese emperor has you know spent 20 30 years trying to stamp out opium they yeah. you know he's been trying to like ban it uh, and he's trying to close the ports down and finally he sends uh one uh one guy he's 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 called uh, commissioner lin uh and lin basically uh, comes to canton which is the main port and he almost single handedly like decides that the opium trade is now over like he he seizes all the opium in the warehouses and he burns them and he kind of like gets rid of it i mean and he's got the mandate from the emperor to do this he's he's and stopping he, this because the addiction is getting worse in in china yeah. 
Yeah, right? so yeah. The emperor and, sees addiction happening in China, and he's like, "We got to stop. This is getting too much." It's not, and it's not just addiction. Also, I think the emperor is also going like, "Hey, like my economy is suffering, right? Like the silver that used to come into my country is now going out, and now I'm running out of silver." Like, there's this whole thing about like, you know, uh, like there is, I'm sure, in some sense, like welfare of the people, like in terms of like all of that, but there's also this like hardcore like economic and political reasons to be like, hey, like my like my rule is being subverted here and I need to kind of stop it. So um yeah so, so Commissioner yeah, Lin uh, bans everything. Yeah he comes in and he uh he basically puts a stop to the opium trade. Uh like you know it's a hard stop and the British like uh they lose their minds and they essentially start lobbying for they, you know, these these merchants, these private merchants, basically start lobbying for the British government to go to war, to officially open up more Chinese ports and to reinstitute the opium trade. Among other things, they have other demands, but they but the real reason is like, hey, like we just lost this huge source of revenue, and we need to kind of get it back. And um, this lobbying is effectively successful, and that's how we get the first opium war. Like officially, British ships, like the navy sales to china to to basically give them an ultimatum of like open up ports or we go to war yeah so they say do they say do they surrender or do they go no we'll fight back which is hence the war yeah i mean yeah they they they, they fight back because the idea is like at this point the chinese emperor is is genuinely he does not think the british are like a concern. He does not respect their military prowess. He does not think that they, uh, as far as he's concerned, like he was doing them a favor by letting them trade like in, in China and they have like insulted him, right? Like, you know, uh, by like, by, by, by smuggling and things like that. So he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't rate them at all. He thinks he has bigger problems. He's got like, you know, uh, enemies on 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 like the, the western border and things like that those are his real concerns and um and these internal rebellions so when the british attack he's and also because his bureaucracy is so weak that he gets such bad information right his his intelligence like you know the the messages coming back are like so poor like they they keep telling him what he wants to hear so they think say things like oh like these british like they're making a fuss and they want us to open more ports and you know they brought some ships and they're threatening us and the emperor is like like destroy them like you know how how dare they do this and uh, so like war starts and then like it goes badly because the british at this point do have like superior firepower they just have like better tactics and the chinese army is so like underpaid and like under like their morale is so low because like soldiers wages are like rock bottom like they're surviving because of the of bribes from the opium trade, right? Like when they let British ships through and they take a bribe, like that's, yeah, that's how, like, that's how, like, you know, the, the army and like the British, the Chinese Navy is sort of like uh, surviving. So they're so demoralized that the British steamroll over them. And as they're doing this, the Chinese emperor is like, okay, have they gone yet? And people keep telling him, oh yeah, yeah, we defeated them. Like, you know, like his intelligence, his advisors will say like, we had this resounding victory over the British and he'll be like, okay, great. And then they'll come back and they'll be like, but somehow the British are still here and they're attacking this place. And he's like, why, why are we not able to defeat them? And he just, he, at this point, he's just so ineffective. And uh, like, it's just, it's just a, a non-functioning kind of, uh, empire like that machinery is just so weak and so crumbling that they, it's just so ineffective so finally the british like you know like the, the emperor realizes that he, he needs to say yes to just get them to leave like you know like he's like i like it's i have i have 10 problems like i have these re rebellions or these insurrections i have all of this stuff i'm trying to maintain my empire and these guys are just an annoyance so he says okay okay and he kind of like gives them everything that they want which is you know they want to open up ports and things like that they want the island of hong kong like this is a big thing they're like they're like we we want the island of hong kong as a british uh, colony Why? Why hong kong? um so hong kong is just it's an island it's so they can they can control all of it it becomes a, it's a great port like they can they can fortify it and they go like this is a base that 
can't be taken away from us. Like that's the strategic kind of political value of Hong Kong, right? Because they were, before that, they were just like uh, operating out of Canton, right? Which is uh, modern day uh, Guangzhou. And, um, uh, and uh, they just, they have these factories there. They have these warehouses in Canton, but then, you know, this, this one Chinese bureaucrat, this commissioner Lin can come and can kick them out and take their stuff. So they're like, we need, we need a base that we can protect, that we can defend. So they're like, give us Hong Kong and this will be our base in this part of the world. Wow. Uh, okay, so they get, they get Hong Kong, they get to go back to trading opium. Do they get to trade opium directly now or it's the same concept where people buy it and go straight to China and sell it there? Um, so they open up other, they open up other ports other than Canton. That's a big thing. And yeah, I think it's still, it's still not legalized. Like that's right. the thing, right? Like the, the, the opium trade, like, uh, I, 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 I am like, my memory is foggy, but I, it's still not officially legalized. I think there's this now understanding that the Chinese emperor is not going to do anything about it anymore. Uh, like, because, uh, like they make this demand, but uh, but the, and the emperor doesn't say yes, but it's not there in the treaty or anything like that. So like I think it becomes de facto legalized at this point, uh, but not not actually officially legalized. And then twenty years later, there's the second opium war, and yes. there it's yes. officially legalized. Like there they go, like okay, like this is like you know. Um, why why is there a second uh, opium war now? Um. There's the there's the there's the kind of official reason for it, and which is like mostly sort of seems like nonsense, seems like an excuse to go to war, which is that yeah you know there's an incident where uh, the Chinese like search a British ship or something like that, uh, but it's not like it's um, the sort of like the real the real economic political reason is that the British are like there are some restrictions on us and China is weak. And I feel like if we go to war with them, we can, we can ease those restrictions even more and we can make even more money out of them and we can open up this country to trade fully. And they just see an opportunity there. And I think that's, it's just like sharks in the water and they, and they go to war because they're like, you know, because any, any restriction on their trade, they are basically seeing as, as, unnecessary and and something that they would like to uh, get rid of yeah. so after after the british win the uh, second opium war now now um now they're making a lot of money now they're getting their tea life is good everything is great what happens to china society chinese the empire of china so this is a this is an interesting thing as well like um yeah by the 1860s like you know opium is just this is the, almost the peak of the opium trade, I think. Like, uh, it's just unheard of quantities are being, uh, are being traded between India and China at this point. Um, and, uh, and so there is a lot of scaremongering about what addiction, opium addiction is doing to China, like in the West, like in, in Britain, in America, there are these images like constantly being circulated of like emaciated like men like you know their bones are all sticking out things like that and they're like this is what this is what opium is doing to china and it's not clear and and there is there's an argument to be made about like hey is that is that overblown like it's obviously detrimental like definitely like like uh, it's it's having a negative effect on people in the sense that like um common working class people probably don't have like the, like selling opium to them as a way of like extracting like money out of them right like it's just uh, it's it's unhelpful it's probably bad for their health in the long run but there is also this important point to note that like among the chinese uh, uh, like like middle class or upper class or whatever there is this opium culture which is you know, quite beautiful and quite nice. Like you get these like opium rooms, uh, like a shisha bar the, kind of thing. Yeah, like exactly. Casually yeah, it, having conversation and and laid back and just having some opium. Exactly, it's exactly like that. You know, you'd have these like beautiful rooms with like like intricate like decorations on the wall, like beautiful lights, 
like these opium pipes that are kind of like again handcrafted like beautiful ornaments and there is this yeah it's like it's like a tea house or like a shisha bar like it's just like any other thing and it's there and it's thriving so like in shanghai which you know you would find like places like this and it's and it's fine so there is this thing about like like for the economy of china it was definitely bad but we, you don't want to kind of dehumanize the chinese people by taking away their agency and saying like oh yeah they were all addicted and they were all like but but the numbers but so that so you want to kind of say that yes it was a huge problem like the it, the estimates are like millions of people right Mil millions of people addicted to opium uh, because wow. of of british policy at the same time you don't want to say that like uh uh you know that this sort of like scaremongering around like how opium like destroys like people or whatever you don't know how to what extent that is that is actually true right because it ties into drug policy of today right like there's a you know there's like the, it, people have been scaremongering about drugs for like uh, like 100 years at this point so yeah yeah um is there i guess opium is now more prevalent in in british society too now because I, i remember watching a lot of i guess peaky blinders there's opium dens and then uh yeah, I, yeah, it's addicted yeah. to opium and they're considered kind of like a like one of those places in society that you that look that's looked down on in a sense yeah from a, yeah. from a from a society from a status from a religious point of view so i wonder um in india how did it how did the freedom fighters and and the politicians feel about opium being being grown in india and being traded in india I mean there were people making money but there were also people who cared about the freedom of India how did they feel about opium Yeah I mean I I'm so I'm so glad that you brought up peaky blinders and stuff like that because <laughs> I think that that is really interesting like the fact like how they show like opium there and yeah you know he's a he's a former soldier right uh, yeah. like uh, Shelby Thomas Shelby like the main with guy like again. PTSD like they all, PTSD they're all they're all suffering Yeah and he's taking opium for that and that is that's a good like that's a good mental picture to have of like you know how opium is used as medication before a certain point i don't know if it's you know how accurate it is for that time period but yeah this whole thing about opium dens there are definitely opium dens in in britain at that time like they are places that like you said are looked down upon and it's unclear whether they look down upon because opium is bad or because like white people go there and mix with non white people you know what i mean they go there oh. and there are there are chinese they giving money to chinese people and they're hanging out with like brown people and it's this whole sense of like this is a place that oh we don't know what goes on there you know and there is this whole like gender angle as well because they're like white men go there and like and interact with like non white women yeah. you know like there's this yeah. whole thing of like this is whole fear of like in these places these are these are spaces where you kind of lose your whiteness or whatever like they're affected i never it's, thought about it that way wow that is so interesting go on sorry yeah 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 it is it's definitely a thing there like and you can you can you can see it in like how people describe opium dens what they're scared about and things like that but um but yeah like uh, so so the so like you said there's a very interesting thing that happens where as soon as the opium trade begins like you know there are people making money off it but there are people in britain the whole time who are like this is bad like this is immoral uh to, this is an immoral trade uh because britain at that point of time has a very strong anti alcohol movement like a temperance movement uh because alcoholism is a huge problem i mean is perceived to be a huge problem there especially by by the church uh and other kind of like religious organizations so there is um so there is a big in uh, anti alcohol movement in britain and um and so there are the same people are are like you know moving to ban opium in britain as well they like this is this is like alcohol you know same problems all of that stuff and then they they are seeing what happens in india they're seeing what happens in china specifically as well like there are all these um, there's all these reports from chinese uh, from from british missionaries in china where they're like they're trying to convert people to christianity but they think they think we're opium traders like they right. don't they don't they're like oh, oh, oh you know white man like 
you, you, you're the you're the people who like sell opium here, and like they're like this 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 reputation is hurting us in our ability to spread spread Christianity here. That's really this our savior savior <laughs> reputation image. Again. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so 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 China, so these missionaries are, are like complaining uh, back in Britain. They're like, you know, we need to stop opium because it's, you know, it's uh, it's 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 not good. Uh, it's not good for religious reasons or whatever, right? And so this is becoming popular in Britain. There are like people. They're a minority voice, definitely. Like merchants and money speak louder, but they are a voice. Like, and you can hear them in Parliament. Like, they have like. MPs backing them who will stand up and who will say in in British Parliament that we need to end the opium trade and all of that. And in India, there are allies, right? Like you know, there is an independence movement. Like Indian like uh, leaders are trying to connect with like British leaders and things like that. So there is like there is dialogue back and forth. But uh, opium is never like uh, like a key part of like the Indian nationalist movement. Uh, and the Indian national movement, Indian freedom movement is also like, is a bit later on, right? It's almost like the opium trade is dying out by the time the nationalist movement really starts. Yeah. Um, uh, and specifically, there's also like, like the Congress, like, you know, uh, MK Gandhi, like, like they had very strong anti-alcohol views as well. They uh, For the same reasons, they were like, you know, alcohol is like, like a way of, Basically, you pay wages to your worker and then you sell him alcohol and take your wages back. Like it's like it's like they're like this is a trap, right? Like you know, um, so they 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 felt like and there was a spiritual angle as well. Gandhi was like you know alcohol is like not good for you or whatever because it's it's impure and that's th- th- definitely a big thing for him because that's that's kind of his his it's moral and spiritual yeah. philosophy. Yeah. Um, uh, but they don't talk about opium much at that point of time because, because, and this is this is this is a complex issue. But primarily because one, they don't want to alienate any allies in Britain who are pro opium, but also pro Indian independence, or like might help them like get more more autonomy or more power. Uh, you know, might decentralize some of that power in right. India. So they don't want to do that. And secondly. Like opium, as far as India is concerned, is an export good that earns them revenue. So even as the nationalist movement is like is like gaining in strength, you know, 20th century, 1910, 1920, like even then people are like, hey, we should not stop the opium trade even if we gain independence, because like we're going to be a new country. We need that revenue. Right. right? Like, why would you take away a source of revenue for such a for for, for this new country when we need it the most? So there is that. Um, so it, it is it is a complex issue. At the same time, there are people, even Gandhi himself, like, as, as changes, he goes, like, opium is like alcohol, like, and he's one of the few people, again, for spiritual reasons, primarily, it's all the more, like, hardcore uh, economics or political, like, uh, uh, leaders of the Indian movement who are, like, you know, don't talk about this, let's not bring it up, you know. That's very interesting. Yeah. What is the ultimate fall of opium? How does opium finally stop to become a commodity? From India's, from the Indian point of view, it happens because, like you said, at some point China starts growing all the opium that they need. Right, right, like, right, so, right. You know, so you know, more and more opium production happens within China itself. So they need, they need less, uh, they need to import it less. At the same time, like, uh, yeah, like production in India has ramped up so much that the prices have rock bottomed and things like that. There are like economic forces at play. Um, also, um, there is growing international consensus that that the drug trade is immoral. Like these voices in like British Parliament and uh, like are like, you know, the consensus is slowly shifting away from hey, this doesn't need to be regulated to this needs to be regulated. Yeah. So in 1906, 1907, you get um, you get these kind of political diplomatic treaties where the British are uh, say that, okay, we're going to stop sending opium to China and the Chinese are like, you know, so there's an agreement that within 10 years or so, you know, uh, all opium uh, import will stop and things like that. And uh, so like, yeah, eventually it is, it is 
first of all, the drug not being as profitable anymore, like as, as a trade good, like other things become more important. So there is less economic pressure. Then there's this international kind of cooperation and consensus that drug trade needs to be regulated. Uh, uh, and then, yeah, the, and then also, you know, there's, uh, yeah, there's strong Chinese sentiment that, it, you know, to, to, to have it stopped as well. Did, did they find a new source of revenue after that or at the end of it? I, I think at this point, like international trade is, is, is more complicated and, and diverse than that. Like it's not, uh, uh, but, but yeah, like, the, you know, you mentioned cotton, like cotton is a big trade good in the 19th century, things like that. But uh, by the beginning of the 20th century, like that's, that's when my knowledge gets a little bit fuzzier in terms of like, what replaces it but right uh, broadly but, i don't think anything has to like you know <laughs> how does how is the boxer rebellion connected to the opium wars oh well, i mean for I mean, those who don't know what is the boxing rebellion first of all and then how is that connected <laughs> so the so this is this is a long time after the opium wars uh so the boxer rebellion is again like yeah beginning of the 20th century it's it's uh it's around um uh, 18, 1899, 1895, 1901. Like it's this, it's this time period. And uh, it's essentially one of the largest popular uprisings against the Chinese uh, state, right? And um, like at this point, like in the middle of the Boxer Rebellion, like it threatens that there is this there is the sense that it threatens the Europeans in China at that point of time. Europeans have a small small presence in China uh, post the uh, Second Opium War. There are embassies and things like that. And like when it looks like the rebellion is going to potentially win or uh, take control or harm these like Europeans, like all the European powers are like okay. Like we need to step in and we need to intervene and we need to kind of uh, militarily uh, step into China. Like they haven't done this so far really, right? Like the Chinese uh, like empire has been autonomous. They have, they've not been um, uh, colonized in that sense, not like India, right? So right. Um, so yeah, so with, you know, with, with the Boxer Rebellion, uh, there is uh, like, like every single European power, it seems that's not a word of it. There, you know, there are a handful of European powers, they all sort of like invade China at this point. And, uh, and yeah, it is, it is like a, a, a terrible, uh, like a terrible, you know, sort of event. And uh, uh, it, it, it ends with like, like, again, like huge, uh, like when they they invade, they put down the rebellion to some extent, and then they sign all these treaties that are again like extremely bad for China. Uh, they they get China to basically pay for their this. It, this is the language they use, right? They're like, we came and saved you, and we spent a lot of money. You need to pay us back for all the money we spent coming here and like and and and, and saving you. So there's this huge war uh, debt that uh, the Chinese end up owing to all these European powers. And this is, yeah, this is completely like a cynical move on their part. Again, they're like, you know, this, this is a, China is weak, let's invade kind of thing. So yeah, it is uh, like, like it, it, is, it is disastrous for the Chinese economy and for the Chinese state. Uh, and generally is around this time also like post these treaties that like the opium trade kind of like comes to, comes to a halt right uh there's this idea that like um uh you know in these in these in these new diplomatic moments uh it, the idea that okay this is this is from a different era you know times were different back then but now we're all modern and we're all uh enlightened and we know that this is bad and uh there's a moment there's actually some a moment when the last uh, the, the last chinese the last ship the last opium export from india to china officially reaches China and uh, and the Chinese set fire to the ship as a kind of statement of going like, this is the end of the opium trade. Like, you know, wow. this was the last legal shipment that we were, that we were uh, supposed to accept and we're, uh, and we're not, so yeah. That's crazy. But let's go back to Hong Kong. Does Hong Kong 
I mean, I look at Hong Kong now and it's a big city. So does yeah. Hong Kong flourish just like uh, Bombay did on, in the within the opium trade? Yeah, it is. It is a very similar story. Yeah, it is the opium trade that kind of uh, first brings money into Hong Kong, and yeah, it's just as the base for British like uh, trade in that part of the world. It just becomes it uh, like it explodes into life. Uh, people from all over the world come there. It becomes like a banking hub. Uh, there's just yeah, you know, like. Uh, it goes from being basically being described as this from the British point of view, right? It goes from being like this barren island that nobody wants to being like this, this flourishing like place. Wow. So why do you think uh, the open trade isn't taught in, in schools? I guess it's an embarrassing chapter for a lot of nations, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure it's, it's taught in China, right? Like I'm sure yeah. it's just not taught uh, anywhere else because I mean, yeah, it is, is a complicated issue from an Indian standpoint, right? Because like I said, like the, uh, it was a dangerous uh, trade, but most of the negative effects were felt elsewhere, not in India. So there right. is this thing of like, you know, like India was a producer here, uh, and yeah, you know, how much how much agency did they have in those choices? All of that, fair enough. But it's it's because we now believe, you know, the now modern consensus is that you know the drug trade is like is criminal or illegal or whatever. Like it it's really hard to go back and explain this complex issue of like, hey, at one point of time this was completely legal it was our single biggest source of revenue and we built this city on on trading it right like yeah. even though we probably knew that it was bad for the people we were selling it to like it was really good for us and we were doing it. so because of that guilt yeah uh, like i think it's a hard uh, it's a hard thing to put into your official histories and to treat responsibly even though it definitely absolutely should be right because like a lot of like the history of the British Empire doesn't make sense without it. Like you can't, like, like the whole point is the British conquered India and they were like, okay, now what? <laughs> like, you know, what do we do with these places? Like we can tax them, but they're like, like it, it, it doesn't give us enough money to, to, to justify the cost of ruling it. Like it's, it's a net loser of revenue in the end. Uh, especially because fighting wars to conquer the rest of the country costs so much money. Right? Like war is just so expensive. Um, and without without opium, without these revenues, you're missing like a key piece in like how how Britain was able to colonize India, how Britain was able to grow as a nation and expand their empire. So yeah, I think it's just like in India, like it should be taught, but it isn't. And in the West, it's just a broader part of, the history of colonialism that is just right. like people right. don't want to talk about. I guess when the British are drinking their tea, they don't really want to know that uh, <laughs> opium is associated with it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know, it's just not the it's just not uh, school wise in history textbooks. It's also in like uh, in uh, movies and and the media. You don't really see much of opium history in it. I mean, I think there's a there's a novel called uh, Sea of Poppies. Where, where I think it probably is the first time I, I realized there's a opium, there's a history of opium in India and in South Asia. But other than that, I don't really see uh, much of opium stories, uh, stories related to opium history, except for maybe, you know, the opium den where the lost white character would go into yeah. to lose himself. <laughs> other than that, there's really nothing, you know, which is very surprising. Yeah, yeah, I... I, yeah, that, that is a really good book, uh, Amitabh Ghosh's whole trilogy about the opium trade. And the second book gets into like um, the coolie trade, like indentured servitude, uh, you know, Indians going to the in, Chinese, Indians and Chinese people going to like uh, plantations in the Caribbean and things like that. Yeah. So yeah, it's, they're all connected and it's a really good series. So I recommend that people go and read it. And Awesome. Um, is there anything you want to add in or talk about? Am I missing uh, something? Uh, are we missing something? Yeah, I mean, 
at this point, I mean, just because we mentioned it, like, yeah, I think there's one chapter in the book, which I am really proud of, which is this chapter that connects opium to, uh, to the histories of cotton, sugar, and slavery. So this yeah, idea yeah. that like, like opium, like I, you know, it's the focus of this book because like, you know, I don't think it's talked about it enough and I want uh, it to be talked about. Um, but, uh, um, but it's connected to this global system of, of empire, right? Of how colonialism happened. Because it is a mystery, right? Like you, you like if, if, you're a, if, if you're a person from the global South, if you're like, you know, you, you do wonder like, hey, we are told that, you know, Britain was this small island and, you know, they didn't have much, like how did they conquer the world? Like there, it's a kind of like a mystery, like you can't piece it together, right? Right. And, and like, to really understand it, like I find it really useful to like understand like how money flowed like across the world and how because right. if you understand the way the money worked, you understand how things were possible uh, and how like this tiny island managed like and generally the European powers in general were able to uh, uh, do what they did and so so I connect I connect opium uh, so opium is already connected to tea. And tea is connected to sugar, right? The idea is that the rise of tea only becomes a popular drink uh, when you can add some sugar to it and make it sweet. Otherwise, it's 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 still a it's still a energizing uh, sort of drink, but it's bitter, right? Right. So, and there is a moment, you know, this is it's hard to imagine a world without sugar, but sugar is a is a recent entrant into into Western society. It's there in India and China for a very long time, but it's it's uh, it enters British society as um uh, as a um, uh as a as a thing that only the rich can afford you know like it's an indulgence the luxury good and then it comes down to the working class and um like like once once people realize how delicious sugar is there's this demand for it and the only way they can service that demand only is again in quotes here is that they decide that they need to uh enslave people and force them to work on plantations and this is sort of like the beginning of the uh, transatlantic slave trade, right? Like, right. and um, and that you know, and you can't talk about slave trade without talking about cotton. And cotton also connects back to India because, um, uh, uh, like, the American uh, the American Civil War, right? This is another really like interesting detail. American Civil War, it's the South that grows, that grows cotton, right? And it's the South, uh, South uh, that uh, has these cotton plantations and all of that. Yeah, and, South of America, uh, South of India. Yes. No, 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 South, South, uh, of, South of the United States. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so um, when, when the American Civil War happens, the North uh, enforce like an embargo, like a trade embargo on, uh, on cotton exports from the South. Right, so the right. South, because they're trying to cut off the revenue for the South, right? They want to, they want to, like, they want to win the wars. So they're trying to eliminate their revenue. So now the British and the rest of Europe that used to get their cotton from the American South need to get it from somewhere else, and they get it from India, and they and it, it gets exported through Bombay, and this is another huge thing for Bombay. So it's like there is, it's all sorry, so it's all kind of connected. Uh, you know, all of these things are connected and it shows, it shows like a global like economic system. Yeah. And uh, it is, um, yeah, I find it very fascinating. I think if more people like understood that, I think we'd like get a better sense of why the world is the way it is today. A lot of drug dealers listening right now are taking notes on how to, <laughs> how to improve their game. <laughs> Follow the money, I guess, is the best way to understand colonialism. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, anything else you want to add? I, I think that's that's that yeah, was really I think that, that was really captivating. That was really interesting. Thank you. Yeah, that was a great conversation. Thank you for having me on. And if anybody would like to read your book, how will they get it? So the the book uh, is primarily only for sale, like in the Indian like uh, subcontinent. It's a kind of rights issue, uh, but. Um, yeah, I you know at some point I hope it gets like a broader release, so maybe people can uh, just follow me on on Twitter or uh, something like that uh, at uh, No True Indian, 
and like if it gets released like i will like let them know but yeah if you're in india you can like please check it out like it's available it's called opium inc uh, uh inc uh how a global drug trade funded the british empire and uh, yeah. yeah it's it's a book written i'm not an academic like i'm a journalist it's a book that my real contribution is that i try and write it in a kind of engaging conversational manner it's a book that's meant to be uh, readable yeah um, like i rely on academics like they're the ones who did the work that lets me kind of like do this but yeah this is a book written for for people to read so if you're interested in this part of history uh, do check it out awesome thank you so much and uh, i'm going to send you an email when it's out and all right thank you take thank care you. bye bye